Welcome to the SEM Says Podcast, the podcast where seminarians say what's said at the SEM. I'm your host, Nikolai Brolinski, and today I'm joined by three special guests. We have with us Mr. Brendan Zayner from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Hello. Um, Mr. Connor Klebb from the Diocese of Arlington. Greetings. And the newly Reverend Mr. James Joseph, also from the Diocese of Arlington. Hello, hello. Golf clap. Uh, all around. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So I've gathered you all here today to talk about the recent experience of your ordination to the diaconate. Um, you're the first of our class of through theology to be ordained a deacon. So that's exciting. What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid you were going to start with the general question. Um, I guess I'll just start with uh, impressions, just be a little impressionistic. Initially, before the ordination happened and before I went on the canonical retreat, the mm -hmm. canonical retreat, uh, we usually do a week-long retreat in preparation for ordination. Um, but before that, I remember thinking it was a little surreal that it was finally happening. We spend so long here at St. Right. Charles. It's, it's a six-year-long program oh, for some long? of us. It, oh, was, did you not know? No. I'm sorry. Oh, what you've gotten in for. You mean the know. two of the half of you have the shortest program <laughs> where I'm talking about length? <laughs> well, Nikolai's over here in what year? Eight years yeah, for the coffee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's a long time, in other words, and so it can get to be a little surreal hmm. um, that it's ever going to end and that, that ordination and, you know, diacon and priesthood are actually going to happen. So when I, when I first uh, was approaching it, there was a little bit of like an unreality to it. Like, oh gosh, I, I guess it's going to happen and it's going to come over me like a wave. But uh, because of the canonical retreat, and I'm glad to say that I'm very grateful to God to say the graces of the retreat, uh, I was able to pray through a lot of that, and uh, God gave me great grace to, you know, have it become real to me. And because of that, I was able to go into the uh, into the ordination confident that I was uh, stepping on firm ground and that mm. uh, God was holding me up. So, thanks be to God for that. I wouldn't uh, wouldn't have been able to um, have so much satisfaction and confidence even um, at the ordination if it were not for that. So thanks be to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. If I've asked you a question, yeah, please. as someone who is like yeah, yourself more. two weeks away from ordination that having gone through a long formation yourself, yeah, like when you think about the fact that in a few weeks you'll be ordained, does that seem real right now? Um, at this point, yeah. Okay. I, I really got over the hump of like the beginning of this semester, it didn't really feel real when it's like, oh, you know, it's three months away. It's like, yeah, that'll never happen. <laughs> but, but yeah, three now months, we're, eight years. we're um, looking down the barrel, as they say. Like it's it's a number of days away. Basically. Right, right. We're getting close um, to the hands. And, 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 so, wow. yeah. yeah, and it's exciting. It really is. And I'm, you know, I really started at like like forty days away, right around Easter. I was like, okay. 40 days is, is a big number, a biblical number. So I'm really going to like try to be conscious of that and, and dedicate this time to, you know, the final steps of preparation for, for the ordination. Like, especially I was like, okay, I've been pretty good about doing the breviary, like well, five hours right. most of the time, but I'm going to really focus on that and like make that a goal that every single day I'm going to be consistent in preparation for making that promise and all that. See the previous episode about the Liturgy of the Hours. <laughs> oh man, I'm sure that was... Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it is real. It is it is funny because I don't know what I'm going to feel like the night before. Right. And, and I you think can never tell. That's going to be like a curious thing to, to, you know, have my family and friends around the night before and be like, wow, that's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> right. yeah. I think but, I um, slept for like two and a half to three hours. <laughs> Could not get to sleep. Because you, wow. first, Arlen has a retreat sure. the exact week before Nation, where you right. had yours back, right. way back in January, right? right? Yeah. yeah. So that's probably it's a little. Big... It's a little different because I don't know about anybody else, but um, I think it's a common thing, but my sleep mm. pattern gets all kinds of messed up on retreat okay. because, you know, you're going to bed early because there's nothing much to do once you've done your prayer periods. And <laughs> <laughs> so you're just kind of staring at the wall. Can't talk to anyone. Uh, can't talk to anyone, of course. And so I, I tend to go to bed early. So I think that might also be a reason why I was not able to get to sleep for that last night or so. Uh, um, yeah. But uh, it was also the excitement, you know, that yeah. th th this is happening. And, you know, yeah. I 
got it right up and got myself dressed and went over hours ahead of time because I wasn't able. I didn't Work think I do. was going to be able to relax before yeah. I actually got to the place. It feels right. like a almost sacrilegious analogy, but I'm thinking of like Christmas morning when you're still like six. Like you're yeah. not. You're, you're up at four. Yeah. You're, just, you're already yeah. up. And you're not going back to bed. So yeah. like, <laughs> when I was thinking about, I'm. I'm I'm assuming it's not like a, a wedding where you you have the whole rehearsal. I mean, you had a rehearsal, but uh, a rehearsal, you don't have a rehearsal dinner or anything. <laughs> well, we did. We did go to dinner with the bishop afterwards, which was a okay. funny thing, because um, I, uh, I actually forgot my black suit up here, oh, uh, which I was supposed to was wear for. to the bishop dinner. Oh uh, yes, um, I remember at the uh, chrism mass, you were in your your nice diocesan well, polo. Well, see, I, I could I could get away with that at the chrism mass lunch, but I could not get away with that at dinner with the bishop with just the bishop, Father Eisenberg, and my one <laughs> classmate <laughs> around the table. I'm sure someone would have noticed I was wearing a polo at some point. So, yeah. uh, thankfully, I was able to cobble together one from. Uh, the priest at my rectory, my my, my parish, yeah. and uh, <laughs> one of them actually was very, very kind. Father Heisig went out and actually bought a black tie for me because no one could scrounge one up from anywhere. Wow, so that's funny. I've <laughs> left it in a drawer at St. Agnes for anyone at for that future <laughs> who ever forgets a tie. And actually, yeah. given your parish's incredible boon of vacations, yeah, we have five, the, the, yeah. the idea of actually yeah. someone not being used to wearing the black suit and at the last second is yeah. actually not that mm. of low chance. It is kind of wild that you think to think about that after becoming a deacon you really for the most part don't need a tie the rest of your life no nope. yeah. that's yeah. wild to me yeah, we know? actually have kind of a semi-tradition at st charles of i forget what it is is it a clap out or around there so the the guys being ordained deacons are supposed to hang all of our ties on one of the statues oh jeez. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, i don't know if this happened in the last couple of years because i think there was some trouble with breaking a statue. Oh, oh. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's unfortunate. Heard, so. It's all but fun it, and yeah. games until a statue gets yeah. well, broken everyone, already. Anyway, so everyone loses their head over it. You know? <laughs> but I do remember like seeing that. Like it was kind of cool at the end of the year to see the statue with just like you know fifteen to twenty <laughs> black that's ties. A, that's a classy <laughs> statue right there. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. all tied up. I will, oh my boy. god! <laughs> if you go down this hallway, actually, so this is really weird. If you go into the, because I, I changed rooms on this hall, and for our diocese in Philadelphia, we usually stop wearing the ties once we get candidacy. Right. But if you, a nail to the back of the door is a tie rack for all the ties I had brought with me to seminary. Because, <laughs> oh, wow. and now, never that's to funny. be used again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that that's that's part of the whole the whole transition. You have to sort of get wrap your mind around, you know, the things you're not going to do anymore and the things you are now going to do. I mm. remember um, Deacon Alex Brown, who lives across the hall from me, roped me in to uh, sub in for him for the college sides, um, Vespers and uh, Exposition Benediction, uh, the adoration that they do on Tuesdays. How many hours um, again was that after you got back on campus? Oh, just a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't uh, imagine what he's subbing in. I can't yeah. imagine what that's like coming back and immediately just stepping into that role. Yeah, yeah, it, it that I have to say will take some more getting used to. But I don't feel I don't feel the imposter syndrome I thought I might feel uh, before mm. I went on the retreat. You know, got all that God given mm. confidence. Yeah, and I, I did. I did the the vespers and the. Uh, and I even did benediction for the first time um, in my life, and that's a really very special feeling. I have to sure. say, to to. I mean, I haven't um, actually done a sacrament yet, uh, done a baptism or wedding like like we're allowed to now as deacons. Mm -hmm. But uh, would it be incorrect to say that that's in persona Christi as a deacon? To bless people with a but yeah, blessing people. I blessing think people you, yeah, you can, yeah is an act of yeah. That's just a Christi. wild, yeah. a wild yeah. change of identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. and I, it's something you unpack and that you don't you don't fully understand when you start out, but it's sort of uh, from the inside. It's it's sort of growing into mm -hmm. into what you will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's a bit like uh, Saint Paul says about uh, what we what we are going to be. We do not know. Yeah. Right. You know, in the, in, the, in heaven, right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. this might be a little bit too, I don't say cynical, but a, sure. a little too, like, on the nose that it does seem around here that just around this time, the current deacon class really seems to have, like, 
grown to understand what it means to be deacon. And then we, <laughs> and then the, just when you're about and by to that, you mean they really want to be out of here? Yeah. Well, no, I mean this. Like, just at the moment you have your hands laid on you to become a, laid on you to become a priest. That's the moment you're like finally mm. because if you've unpacked a little bit of what it means to be a deacon, and then yeah. Yeah. change your identity again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember telling my spiritual director, Father Carbonaro, last year that I was ready to be out of school. And he, he, he told me, you're not allowed to feel that way yet. Uh, you, can, you can feel that way in your deacon year. Even we want them gone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we'll never want you gone, James. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, for those of you that don't know, I'm in pre-theology one, the other end of the right. spectrum. Yeah, you're... And so, like, I'm just starting out. Did you go to your diocese priest ordination last year? I did, but okay. I was... Um, they were in a different row, yeah. Oh, gosh, what was the date? When, I mean, it must have been in June, right? So I would have mm. been accepted by that time. Okay. I, was, I was accepted in March. Had you gone to a, your, the transitional deacon ordination, though? No, I did not. So that was yeah. your first... This is my first diaconate. So again, wow. see. And see you know, James. I have to say, the cantor for the Litany of the Saints, oh my God. He, was, <laughs> he was top. So. I, I, I agree. The one further on the left facing the sanctuary was really, really uh, spot on. But on the right, I don't does know. His name, does his name rhyme with Schlon or Schlub? This man of mystery. No, I, I didn't realize that was your first time being an ordination like the act of ordination that's really cool yeah it was it was it was really cool well, what are your impressions of somebody yeah, that's seeing it for the first time well i i have to say up until the litany of the saints i was just kind of freaking out to, <laughs> to have to sing in front of all of my peers and the fair. bishop yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but after that i have to say um it it really is i mean it's beautiful there's it's hard to describe just like the culmination of a lot of of prayer and work mm -hmm. that 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 you see right and it's interesting seeing it as like a goal yeah it's mm -hmm. and as a seminarian it's kind of i don't know it it made it a little bit more real for me yeah mm -hmm. i agree so yeah i i've i i haven't really thought about it too much since then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just relieved yeah. to be done singing yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I that was really that was kind of a big thing unfortunately I, uh, and Hopefully you can just cut the all. Cut all this <laughs> yeah, yeah. You did great. You, you were really uh, good. Uh, um, I'm kind of curious. Uh, this is very, very like picky in question. What is the hardest saint name to chant <laughs> after a session? Are there any ones that really create? I mean, I think Kateri Tekakwitha is pretty tough. That 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 could be. I can see yeah. how that uh, one. Yeah. yeah. I but I think I think Colby had that one. On, on <laughs> so. I didn't Polish have to that tends one. to be a little. I, I got all the Austria. I got all the cool ones. I got Blessed Carl and uh, <laughs> that was mine. Thank James yeah, for was mine. Yeah. And what was your other one? Uh, uh, Saint Pius the Tenth. Saint Pius. My confirmation. I got Pius the yeah. Tenth too. So oh, so you got both yeah. the Jameses. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. So here's here's a question for you, James. What was going through your head as you were lying on the floor as the litany of saints is being chanted? The the to be deacons lie prostrate on the, the floor of the church or cathedral. In front of the altar and everybody is praying for them but what's going through your mind at that moment yeah i remember um the class in front of me deacon andrew clark told me before the ordinations that that and other people told me that too, this too but uh, he said that it's a great time to ask god for a really really big grace something <laughs> okay. you've been really wanting for a long time that's a really big ask and so i was i, I had one in mind from the retreat that I wanted to ask for, and so I was busy petitioning, um, or trying to petition, and also, you know, trying to calm my nerves down and uh, stop uh, trying to stop myself from wondering whether I was lying correctly. Um, <laughs> right. So there's a, there's a little bit of like like thinking about what you're doing and like I trying to what stop my feet yourself. Look like. but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Wait, are, is everyone staring at the soles of my shoes? But then, <laughs> then then you sort of like try and but no, I'm only going to be doing this twice in my life. I want to banish all these stupid thoughts, mm -hmm. and so. Yeah. Yeah, I was just trying to, um, you know, hold that that request, that petition to God in my mind, and yeah, yeah, that was pretty much it. Yeah. You know, I will say, going back to from from a from a newcomer's mm -hmm. point of view, I, I do have to say, you know, if I can get a little open about myself, is you know, and, I, and and it's not a it's not an uncommon experience, but when you're here at seminary, you tend to focus on like what you're not doing right, and. Sure. That's because it, I mean, it is, it's about formation. formation. Yeah. You need to see what you need to, to improve on. But, you know, so, so stuff comes up in prayer and you're like, am, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I actually growing closer to the Lord? Sometimes it's not always easy to tell uh, as much as you'd like it to be. 
but if I may say, I hope this is, doesn't offend, but, you know, you're up there as a new deacon right after being ordained, and you're being told what to do by the MC, but, you know, you're not perfect at it. You're brand new, and so, yeah. no, that's you know. certainly true. I accidentally tried to give communion to uh, Bishop Emeritus Laverti. <laughs> I'm sure he'd really appreciate it. Yeah. Besides, you crushed the Paul, and well, that's the hardest part. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, I felt very shell-shocked, honestly, yeah. too, afterwards, because I felt like I kept babbling to everybody I came across. And, yeah. Like, isn't yeah. this great? Here we are. Like, yeah, but for me, being a new guy and then seeing, okay, this is the guy that's going to be the most experienced at, at seminary, like, it's just, it brought back that realization that God works with, with what, what we have to, right. to offer. You know, yeah. we're never yeah. going to be perfect at everything. But that's not what he's asking for. He's just asking for a willing heart. Yeah. So right. that brought a lot of hope to me. Um, yeah. Seeing that, yeah. I have to say. That is one observation I remember having here over the years, that when you first enter, there are guys who are already deacons or guys who are about right. to be deacons. And while, in a sense, you're at seminary with them, in, in your mind, they kind of already are, you almost already, like, entering, I almost already saw them behind the altar. I almost already saw them right. as kind of yeah. your nation because it just seems so far away. So it was kind of easy to see them when they didn't actually get the name priest. Yeah. But then as through you progressed, and it's no longer people who were already pretty close to that when you started, the people, when you introduce all more just fellow seminarians just in a slightly different year, and they're like, whoa, 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 what are you doing being ordained? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is, that is right. a true thing. And, um, yeah, it's easy as a, as a new guy especially to see the guy who's in third or fourth theology and he's got, like, the perfect slick back hair and he never misses a note. He's got the whole seminary system yeah. figured out. Like, like, he's got to right, figure it out. Right. And you're like, wow, like, okay, he's clearly meant to be a priest or whatever. Right, yeah. And, you know, you compare yourself and then when, when I get to third theology, I'm like, okay, my hair is often a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the best singer in the world. Oh, Am I still driving down to morning prayer at St. Martin's every day? <laughs> Maybe. I well, to be fair, it's a long way. It's a long <laughs> yeah. way. So. But, but Come on, God. And, you know, my prayer and reflection is like, no, this is, the Lord is calling me. He's not calling a fake me who doesn't exist. Yeah. He's right. calling me. Right. And, you know, maybe maybe that that guy that you look at and compare yourself to, maybe he is perfect, but like probably not. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Well, and, we, and that's we, okay. That's who the Lord is calling. Exactly. Yeah. We, we do need to put on like at least a veneer of competence. Like we know <laughs> what we're doing. <laughs> the, the funny thing is I can do that as like an altar server. Yeah. I've been doing that for years. I yeah. can, I can do that. But like I, I, you know, singing at mass or whatever, like I, I find myself like shaking oh, yeah. involuntarily. Yeah. And so that was actually another question I had for you well, uh, is like, particularly like, when I read at Mass versus, like, serve, serving, nothing stupid can come out of my mouth. You know, I keep yeah. my mouth shut and I just walk <laughs> right. walk around, do things that I need to do. But when I'm reading, like, there's something about the Word of God mm. coming yeah. from my mouth. And, like, I could really screw this thing up if I just get a word wrong. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, people are, are forget forgi- uh Yeah. People forgiving, are forgiving. Yeah. I don't know why Speaking I of that. words, yeah, hard exactly. Time. Well, there you go. There you <laughs> yeah. go. So yeah. I, I guess my my question is, I mean, we're going to have to give homilies, and there's other things besides oh, yeah. just public speaking that we're talking about here. And I know we have classes on this stuff, but what helped you get through this kind of stuff? Did you did you struggle with with nervousness uh, speaking in front of people, and and what was the process throughout seminary like that? Yeah. I guess I'm going to have to go back a, a little way for this one because I'm a convert, and so it's kind of been a learning curve uh, mm. ever since I started being a Catholic. I remember being nervous the first time I tried praying the rosary, um, wondering whether it was a sin to do the mysteries on the wrong day. Um, <laughs> and I remember you know, messing it up and you know, going, saying, do I have to go back to the beginning? For any Protestants listening, it's not a sin. Yeah. <laughs> try, it, try it out. Yes, yes, and right, frankly, yeah. for any Catholics listening, it's yeah. not right, a sin. That, that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I, I remember my first time serving Mass. I was nervous too. My hands kept shaking when I picked up the cruets and hmm. I think as, as time goes on and it, it, the motions and what you're actually supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it become more familiar to you I think you can do a little less navel gazing because hmm. honestly that's been one of my worst flaws and one of my spiritual struggles is to be less navel gazing sure. um, and so when you when you stop thinking take reading for example when you stop thinking of how enormous a thing it is to be reading the word of God 
because that's just you thinking about what, what you're what you're doing rather right. than instead of actually, actually reading actually it. doing it. <laughs> right. So I think just getting used to it is one thing, and just like being a deacon, I don't have the muscle memory, I don't have the the, the right. competence yet, and sure. so I can't put on that veneer of competency yeah. that we all yeah. that we all put on not yet but what, when you do you can actually do those tasks and pray during them Pr- pray during mass yeah. right right and, and i can't do that yet because i still have to think about what the heck i'm gonna what i'm supposed mm-hmm. to do next yeah when you develop that that knowledge and that muscle memory you you can actually turn it into a great spiritual spiritual practice yeah yeah i guess the danger is sort of the other extreme which you hear about and like not just hear about like big experience yourself on those masses where you're just attending mass i shouldn't say just attending mass but participating in the sacrifice just sacrifice yeah assisting as one of the faithful Mm -hmm. and the mass has a danger of coming almost like blase right right it's like sort of just routine situation and like it seems terrible to say that like being a deacon at the mass would be Blase or got rid of like a priest, but the reality is that once that muscle memory does come in, and you you probably can in a sense go through the motion, so to speak, right. and yeah. land everything correctly. You kind of have to deal with from the other side as well because you're so focused on that aspect of things. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I remember I came into the church mostly by reading G.K. Chesterton, and there's a wonderful passage in Orthodoxy. I think it's in the chapter, as I was just looking at this, this quote again the other day, I think it's in a chapter called The Ethics of Elfland, <laughs> which is a great name for a chapter of the book. I think um, I remember that chapter, but, actually. Uh, he, he's got a wonderful quote about how God doesn't get tired of beautiful things, mm-hmm. how he can he can see a sunrise or a flower bloom yeah. over and I remember over that over chapter, again. yeah, I remember yeah. that. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and he, he, he says that, that, like a little child who mm-hmm. keeps saying, do it again, do, do it, it again. again. Yeah. God, God doesn't get tired of these things, and so mm. he's, maybe he he says maybe he tells the sun every day when it rises, do it again, do it again, or yeah. a flower. That's yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I love that passage. Yeah, I remember, I remember reading that and just being like, wow. It's yeah. us. He says it's us that grow old and tired of things, and God, our, our he said, what does he say? Our, our father is younger than we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it really yeah. is a mind opening passage. Yeah. It says, yeah. Everyone knows a baby who's like playing playing, playing peekaboo for well not half an hour and yeah. <laughs> yeah. well and having having said that it's i guess it's it practice we need to and i'm by no means an expert at it or good at it in fact the capacity to go to mass and do that and and look at it with wonder every time right. because of the yeah. miracle that it is and we're so used to it that we sometimes we can't see it so. right yeah. well, I, I, i'm reading dorothy day's autobiography mm-hmm. the long loneliness and it's beautiful and she was also a convert as well. And one of the reflections that she gave on attending Mass, of course, she's writing in the 1950s, so it's it's the old Tridentine Mass, I guess, is about ritual. And she talks about how, like, the altar boy kisses the cruet before he hands it to the priest. And she describes that, you know, for a lot of the time, it becomes so rote that it's just like, whatever. And, like, it's it's not done in a very reverential way, but she talks about that's still important to do it. Even if kind of like you're not totally aware and conscious of it like she she uses the analogy of a husband who gives his wife a kiss before he goes to work yeah and he does it every single day and even if he just does it absentmindedly or his heart's not like totally in it like it's important that he does that yeah yeah um yeah. and that wife will and, miss it yeah, yeah oh, she'll miss it there. and so yeah. it's an important thing to like to be true to our rituals and you know not that we should let them become rote but like it's okay if they do some sometimes, right. and you know we should just draw ourselves back into it, into the mystery of it. Yeah, that's just human um, nature, and the nature of original sin. Are yeah, is our one of the one of the things about original sin is our short attention spans and, and yeah. growing shorter. <laughs> yeah, by the minute. So, yeah, that, that's definitely something that. Yeah, I think entering into the diaconate and the priesthood will be something I want to take with me. Of like, okay. You know, the first the first couple of days when I say the Lord be with you, it's going to be like, oh, I'm going to say that. <laughs> and then, you know, the hundredth time it's like, OK, the Lord be with you. <laughs> right, right, right. But, you know, to to be attentive to the mystery and the ritual and the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and taking the pall on and off the chalice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This the reality that it's you know, our Lord's blood in the chalice, mm, yeah. which he's given out up for us. And that's what you're uncovering and covering. And. 
right now I'm still at the stage of, you know, worrying whether I'm doing it at the right time yeah. so that I don't have time to think about that. But I, I hope that when it mm. becomes rote, um, when it becomes something I'm, I'm f- so familiar with, I hope that I'm able to, you know, pray with it. In my sure. Head. Yeah. Mm. So. Well, you mentioned that you were a convert, and I remember this because it's a pretty well lined up because as part of when you made your confirmation, you made a profession of faith into, into the church. And um, as part of our preparations for being mm. ordained, we actually make a profession of faith before ordination. In fact, for mm. uh, Nicolai and myself, stuff is happening in 24 hours. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. uh, yeah. But I think yeah, you made your profession yeah. of faith to her to be a deacon almost in the same week, almost off the anniversary of your Ten year anniversary of making for right? confirmation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that wow. that's right. It was within a few days of um uh, I think it was March thirty first, uh, was uh Easter in twenty thirteen, mm-hmm. um, which is when I was received into the church and confirmed and all that. So it was uh yeah, no, very close. I did the profession of faith and the oath of fidelity to the magisterium. Mm. Which is a very special thing and you used your Bible, in fact. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was so was becoming a priest was that something that was in in your purview from the time you you were converting, or was that something that came around about later? I remember wanting to be a Protestant minister when I was a Presbyterian. My great grandmother, one of the last things she told me in her life was, I think you'd make a good minister. She was a Lutheran. Um, and so I, on her, I guess. I mean, <laughs> well, she was a high church Lutheran. So. Her, her church actually has a, ta- has a tabernacle. So oh, wow. That's, that's, that's interesting. But in, in any case, um, I fell in love with the liturgy and with the history of our, of our liturgical practice and did my MA on that. And so falling in love with the priesthood was initially something that I did just because of its intellectual content. But Hmm. over the years, my conversion has sort of seeped into the ground, you know, starting on the surface level with my ideas and then down into your spirit and and your uh, your emotions even, and then finally down to your bad habits, hopefully. (laughs) So... um, The last enemy to be defeated. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So I, I, I was not initially thinking I was going to become a priest, but I think that aspect of the faith is what attracted me to it in the first Mm. place. And so I think it was sort of a natural consequence of falling in love with this aspect of reality that I had not been aware of and not been taught as a Protestant, Um, and just finding it so beautiful and fascinating that I wanted to spend the rest of my life next to it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got I got a different vocation story than most, but it's uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of platonic in yeah. a way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, imagine how sad it would be if your vocation story, which is one of the most intimate parts of God's calling for your life, was the exact same as someone's. That that would be the really <laughs> a terrible one, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right. um, Connor, so you're new to the seminary. Do you have much of a vocation story that you'd like to share? Ooh. Uh sure. I, it does shock me that there's so many converts here. I think it's very cool to see that. I mean, I've probably met five or six guys. I'm sure there's more Hmm. that have converted to Catholicism. My vocation story is, it's a little bit more (laughs) classic, I guess you'd (laughs) say. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, you know, grew up in in a, a very Catholic family, one of seven children, middle child. And so... Uh, the year I was born, actually, my dad converted from Methodist. Hmm. And so I, w- I went through RCIA with my mother and father. My mom kind of had a reconversion that year as well. Hmm. So th- they used to joke that I knew my, my catechism before I was one year old. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was it, growing up, uh, our faith was it was a part of our, our daily life. We used to have rosaries at our house every weekend with different families, which was a really cool example of like community life and like Mm -hmm. the body of Christ. And uh, at mass on Sunday, my dad always made it very clear that we were to sing all of the hymns. We were to do all the responses because that was for him, that was part of the duty of Mm. what we're there to do. And instead of just sitting there in the pew and doing nothing, Full and so, active and conscious participation. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, my dad being a convert, I don't know if he really understood the reality of that, how important that was. But for, for us as kids, like, um, just that example of my father caring that much to, mm-hmm. to, to, to do that. So I remember the first time 
I thought about being a priest was around fourth grade. That was also the, coincided with the time that I could serve at the altar. Mm-hmm. Very classic. And uh, so I, I loved doing that. I loved the, the closeness to our Lord that I could experience through that. Um, but I also had really good examples uh, for priests. Um, one in particular stood out to me, uh, Father Paul Grankowskis. He was a really good uh, example of just like a normal guy, <laughs> but also like really smart, really holy. Yeah. But he would come over to the house for dinner, come sometimes to those family rosaries, and he was just like, he was a baby priest when he first came to our parish, but he was just like, you know, a normal guy who liked, we would go to the movies with him, watch Star Wars. He was a, he was a big Trekkie. Next generation. Uh, uh, good man. Good clarification, I that's suppose. Right. Mm. Yeah. Uh, my dad and him always had this thing because my dad was original Trekkie and, and he was a, a next generation guy, but they got along otherwise. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he was just like an example of like a normal guy that you could hang out with and mm. and it, when sometimes priests seemed a little bit unapproachable. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Um, so that was a really good example for me. Mm. I had that time in my life where I thought, oh, yeah, maybe being a priest would be cool. Um, and then high school rolled around, and there were a lot of pretty women <laughs> in high school. It does tend to derail things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how I describe it is that I, I totally understood that the, the vocation of the priesthood was a vastly, uh, you know, it's supernatural vocation versus the natural vocation, both wonderful and, and totally awesome. For me, though... You know, I understood that. I went through 12 years of Catholic school. I actually went through 16 years of Catholic school. So I went to a Catholic college, too. Yeah. Now, I guess, 17 years. Mm-hmm. I understood that, but for me, the desire was just so much. It, it just was the, the desire for marriage just outweighed the yeah. desire for priesthood at, at that time. And there were just two instances. The first was like kind of the instance of reconversion, where this kind of idea of the priesthood came back into my mind. So my reconversion happened when we visited my two sisters during Parents Weekend at Franciscan University, Mm -hmm. which ended up being my alma mater. Mm -hmm. Actually, all of us went there. (laughs) (laughs) Once Franciscan has you in the tractor beam, it's just not... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, the the smaller siblings in our family are not that creative. Uh, So, (laughs) But anyway, we went up there, and I remember we went to a household life mass there, which is this mass where there's these things called households on campus. It's basically a Catholic frat. Hmm. And all of the different households were there. And so you have like 1,500 people packed into this field house for Mass. And it was the first experience I had of like 1,500 people all praising the Lord at the same time, singing yeah. everything, responding everything, and like wanting to be there. And by the end of Mass, I was like in tears mm. because I just, I had never experienced anything like that. And the Holy Spirit had just like come into my heart um, in a very real way. So that was kind of a, the start of a reconversion back to the faith and kind of making the faith my own. Realizing that I could I could have a relationship with our Lord that didn't really have to encompass my parents. Sure, oh, that's um, important. important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and still I went through high school, and um, you know prayer life was on and off, but it, it was more up than down. And then I remember really the first time that the spark for a vocation to the priesthood was lit again in my my heart was it was I was at home during high school and we were watching my mother and I were watching the vigil for life which is the big live stream mass uh, at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in DC and it's this huge mass where where pro-lifers from all over the country are there there's tons of priests and I just remember watching that with my mom all my siblings were in the other other room I think we had some friends over and they were playing some board games or something but it was just me and my mom I think we were making lunches for the March for Life the next day and we were watching it, and there were two things that really struck me. The first was when I saw all these fantastic priests process in. Yeah. And you have like 50 or 60 priests who are just processing in and sitting behind the altar mm. to con celebrate this mass. And a lot of these priests were from my diocese because we live right outside of D.C. And it was just really cool to see all these really solid priests that I knew yeah. doing that mm. and being like this public witness of masculinity for the faith, just a public witness for the faith. The second part was during the doxology at Mass, where Mm -hmm. all of those guys were saying through him, with him, and in him. Mm -hmm. Something within me just, like, moved. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, like, well, like, maybe, maybe I could, I could be a priest. Mm -hmm. 
And I think I said that to my mom. I, I don't remember. I'm sure my mom played it cool. I like, didn't want to like, <laughs> oh, you know. You know I, I think she was like, oh, that's in, that's cool, honey. Interior, you know? <laughs> interior screaming. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, so that was like a really, I, I remember that moment. Yeah, that's awesome. And so after that, I finished high school and I, I went to college. And I, I dated in high school and college a few girls. But it never really seemed to work out. And then just through prayer, experiences with priests, uh, talking to them, experiences with friends and just talking stuff out, eventually just like step by step, mm. the two vocations of, of marriage and priesthood became like kind of equal in my like desires. Mm. And so by the time junior year of college rolled around, I was very like, I was very confident that I could be fulfilled and happy yeah. in either vocation. Yeah. But then I st stayed in that, you know, kind of happy medium for a long time. I was like, right. well, you know, if, if God right. wants me to be a priest, he's going to make the clouds part and say, oh, yeah, be yeah. Like yeah. Priest, you know? <laughs> which is right. early on in, in yeah. everybody's process. That's early on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I didn't really pursue that actively. Mm -hmm. I dated a couple other girls that didn't work, work, really work out. And then I graduated college and I started working. And then where it really became real was I... I was working for a few months and I decided to go on a, a silent retreat and I still hadn't figured out my vocation and so I decided to, to make this silent retreat for the discernment of my vocation. So that was my intention going in. And this was also my first experience on a silent retreat which was powerful too, mm. which was cool. And so about halfway through the five day silent retreat, it was a preach retreat and somebody gave a talk on asking what the Lord wants for your life. And mm -hmm. letting your yes mean yes, and letting your no mean no, and like being a man of your word. And I was like, okay, cool. So I took that to prayer. They gave us some, a biblical meditation of some kind, which mm -hmm. I, I did. And I took some notes, and then I set that aside next to me. Um, I remember I was in the, the dining hall of the retreat center in front of this huge open wood fire, which is like a happy place for me. Mm -hmm. And so I set that aside, and I, and I started praying. I said, okay, Lord. Uh, what do you want for my life? And I heard the internal voice of God within my heart say, well, first I want you to come sit before me in the Eucharist. And I was like, okay, sounds cool. <laughs> and so I, I got up and I walked. Just set my stuff down. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I got up, I walked across the street to, to the chapel where we had the Blessed Sacrament exposed in the monstrance. And I sat down in the back, you know, as a good Catholic does. And mm -hmm. uh I said, okay, Lord, what do you want for my life? He said, I want you to come up front and sit before me in the Eucharist. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you're not going to make this easy, all right? And so I, I walked up to the front, and I sat in the front row right before the our Lord in the Eucharist. And I said, okay, Lord, what do you want for me, for my life? And, I, and he said, I want you to apply for seminary. Hmm. And I took a half second, and I replied yes. And in that moment, I was filled with consolation of joy, yeah. um, excitement, peace, yeah, I mean it's it's a nerve wracking moment when yeah. you just when you say yes to God. <laughs> yeah, about something like that. It's, Anything could happen. Yeah. Right, and yeah. so I, I was I was nervous about it, but it was it, but it was more excitement and peace, um, which was awesome, and I was excited to share it with people. And but that was tough because I had two more days on the silent retreat, yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't talk about it except to to my spiritual director. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, uh, and my family was all very supportive. My friends were very supportive, which was awesome. Yeah. And the next week I was in the vocations office and Father Eisenberg was like, well, yeah, it sounds like you might have a vocation, but, <laughs> but you have some student debt you're going to have to pay down. <laughs> nice. So, so yeah, uh, I've been working for the last three years paying down my student debt. And then finally last year I paid it down to the threshold they wanted me to pay it down to mm -hmm. and, uh, Got the application, was accepted on March 19th, St. Joseph's Feast Day. Oh, so, wow. God bless. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. Wow. So, and, and it's so clear that, like, obviously when you figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life, you want the rest of your life to start as soon as possible. Yeah. 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 Right. So it was tough. It was kind of a bummer that I had to wait. But at the same time, I mean, in retrospect, it's easy to see that it was, it was all God's timing. Yeah. Because in that time, I quit the job I was doing, and I got a job as a teacher at a Catholic school. And it was the best job I've ever had. Yeah. I just fell in love with teaching, learned a ton about myself. I particularly learned about um, spiritual fatherhood. 
Yeah, um, oh, for sure. Which is a huge thing, and and not uh, yeah. not just to like the kids, but also to like the people that I was working with. Because mm. believe it or not, it's not everybody in. at a Catholic school <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> is like <laughs> a practicing Catholic. That's right. um, yeah. yeah, and 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 even if you are practicing Catholic, everybody's you know has their own wounds. Yeah. So just mm. you never to stop people. needing spiritual fatherhood. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, you know, just talking to people, and I grew a lot in that way, and mm. and I I do genuinely think that if I hadn't taken those three years, sure. which right. for all intents and purposes was a time of discernment for me. I, like I talked to my spiritual director, I talked to Father Eisenberg. They were like, it's probably not a good idea to, to date at that time. So I, I didn't date at that time. So mm-hmm. I just kind of started discernment early. Hmm. And I genuinely think that if I had entered when I wanted to, I don't know if I would be here. Sure. Yeah. You know, okay. in the, in the, at the end of my second semester. Sure. So okay. it was all, it was all in God's timing. And yeah. I'm so happy to be here and I'm, I'm happy that he called me and yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think, if I may, like, I, I definitely felt that kind of same way, too, where you have to make that leap, where you God gets you to this point, and he says, I want you to jump. Yeah. And you just have to do it. Well, and that's then, faith, then right? Yeah. yeah. Like, he's never going to yeah. force himself upon you. He's always going to have you make a choice. Yeah. yeah. You know, because it's just not in him. He, he, he He's a lover, you know? Yeah. And a good spiritual director will be able to tell you, ah, yes, that voice, that sounds like the Lord, yeah. Yeah. or not. You know? Right, so, right. Yeah. Right. So I've been blessed to have just great people in my life that have helped yeah. me get this, get, get to this place, and, and and guide me. And yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't be happier with the seminary. I wanted to go to the Mount actually, because <laughs> that's, that's that's the other one that we send to. Um, yeah. And it's it's a little bit more out in the country. I, I like hiking and and yeah. kayaking and all that stuff. So I really wanted to do that, but then on when I got that call from the bishop, he was like, "Yeah, we're going to be sending you to St. Charles Borbeo Seminary." I was disappointed for like ten seconds, and I was like, "Wait a second, I'm going to seminary! Like I, I, I've been waiting three years for this. Yeah, like yeah. I'm 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 so happy to be going." And then you remembered you were going to Philadelphia, and it was oh, all yeah. <laughs> again. All right, all right, all right. Well, I had I had actually never been to Philadelphia yeah. before showing up here, but I have to say, uh, I couldn't ask for a better experience. Awesome. I mean, all the guys that I've met here have just been super welcoming and just, it fills one with a tremendous amount of hope for the church, I have to yeah. say. Philadelphia's not such a bad place. All right. All right. For, uh, this, this is, I, I, re, I realize that the right now the room is three to one against me. <laughs> well, may I remind you where we are currently sitting? <laughs> well, on that happy note, thank you all of you for, for joining for the seminary podcast and thank you listeners for tuning in um, hopefully this was an edifying conversation we or at least entertaining, yeah, entertaining. Or at least entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> you could, it could be both yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's always the final possibility cure for insomnia okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. well thanks Nicole for having us okay. yeah, thank you yeah. so yeah. much thank you, yeah. God bless. Um, be sure to rate us on whatever platform you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever else the kids are using these days <laughs> And share with your friends and loved ones. God bless. God bless. Bye-bye. Good night.